All right, let's do an honest sound check. Test, test, one, two, I disappointed my parents. Two, two. <laughs> Testing, one, two, bad career choice. One, two, one, two. Anyone have a couch I can sleep on? Two, two. One, two, dreams fading. Test, test. One, two, okay, I think we're good. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Marin. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Pleasure to see you. I'd like to open by saying that I am not happy or well, so rest reassured, <laughs> things will continue to be panicky and awkward. Oh my fucking God, I cannot handle the fact that things are going well. Look, all you guys came out and I cannot fucking handle it. The last CDs I did were in the worst comedy club in the country for half a house. Because I wanted it that way. Things are okay and I can't handle it. When things are going well with me, there is a voice inside my head saying, you're gonna fuck it up. You're gonna fuck it up over and over again. And I just wish that voice was louder than the voice saying, let's fuck it up! Come on, you pussy, fuck it up. You pussy. Burn some bridges, alienate your friends, ruin your career, start drinking again. Sit on your couch drunk and crying with nothing left to lose. Have you forgotten what freedom feels like, you fucking pussy? Doing well, fuck you. So that's happening right now in my head. Welcome to it. It's a thrill to be in New York. I always like being in New York. I'm emotionally frazzled. I might explain that to you, why I'm emotionally frazzled in a little while. But uh, like I'm frazzled to the point where things are a little tweaky. I didn't get much sleep. I'd flown in yesterday, and I, and I had this very weird, genuine New York moment. I was on an elevator in a building in Manhattan. There was a guy on the elevator with me, looked exactly like Spalding Gray. <laughs> And my first thought was not, you know, he committed suicide years ago. It's not Spalding Gray. My first thought was like, you pulled it off. <laughs> my lips are sealed, bro. <laughs> Looking forward to the show. <laughs> I've been here for a couple days. And this, you guys, I, I'm just, I'm happy that, you know, adults come to see me. I, I'm happy, uh, y'all seem pretty good. Not too many annoying hipsters. I, I know that... <laughs> Well, I, I can't judge. I mean, look at me. I, I've got a facial hair configuration of some sort that, that doesn't happen, like, completely organically. I'm doing something. But I, I don't see myself as a hipster. I sort of rationalize it being like, you know, I'm a middle-aged man who's made a facial hair decision. But, like, I literally get, you know, angry at, like, a handlebar mustache. Angry. I get angry if I see the handlebar mustache. I'm literally, I, I, or fedora. Fuck, I can't, I can't handle. But why should I just, why should I be angry at that? I saw a guy with a handlebar mustache and a fedora wearing joppers. And, and I was like, fuck you, fuck you. You know, commit to something. What, are you, what is going on? It looked like he was interrupted during a shave in the mid-1850s and had to dress quickly as he ran through a time tunnel. I mean, what are you saying with that? All you're saying is, I'm working on me. I'm trying to put something together for myself. What else you have going on? I thought, this is it. A lot of effort into making something work. I, uh, I have my notebook. I have my small spiral notebook. These are cheap. They're like, you can get them like five for a dollar ninety-nine at Costco. I just, this is what I use. This is the way I work. You know, I cannot, I, I, will, I will not buy a, a moleskin notebook ever again. I, I can't handle the pressure. <laughs> have, have you ever bought a moleskin notebook? I mean, you, you know, they've got the leather bound and there's a strap around them. I bought one once. And the second I scratched a word out in the moleskin notebook, I was like, I fucked it up. <laughs> Gotta throw it away. God forbid you ever rip a page out of a moleskin. You really have to battle with the desire to quit writing altogether. I've disappointed the moleskin book. 
I did not live up to its expectations with its fine leather bound strapped together self. So I write these little ones and if I write, you know, I can't read my writing really. And if I write and you know, I can read it and it makes it over to the yellow pad, if I can read it there, maybe it'll get out of my mouth. But I write things in these impulsively and I have to have them at all times. I hear something I wrote apparently on a plane. There was a baby on the plane that was crying at such an irritating pitch. If I met her as an adult, I would still resent her. <laughs> You gotta make sure you write that stuff down. <laughs> you know, I battle with things. Many of you know that. I think I'm a good person. I say that to myself frequently. Do you ever say that to yourself? Like, in, you know, in, in your mind, like, I think I'm a good person. That never just happens spontaneously. Yeah, it's always followed by the thought of, you know, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Why is there a woman crying again? <laughs> But we all think we're good people, even though I don't do much. I spend a lot of time in my head. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm doing things that are good necessarily, but, but there's, because I, I clearly have a life where, you know, my behavior is not always tremendous, but I guess that's no different than anybody else. But I, I think I'm a good person. It's almost like saying, well, in my head, you know, I got, I got a 24 hour around the clock soup kitchen. It's open. <laughs> right now, it's, it's open. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta wheel Dennis over to his table. He's a vet. Okay, I'll get you another roll. I'll get you, don't fucking yell at me, I'm your friend. I get it, the gulf, I get it. I'll get you a roll, Dennis, I'm not doing this every day. Let me get out of my head. I spend a lot of fucking time in my head. I uh, was recently, you know, walking in my house. I have a very small house, the two bedroom house with the garage out back. Small house, no one's in the house but me. I'm walking down the hallway from my dining room to my bedroom. Small house, alone, short hallway. Out loud in the hallway, I said, you're fucking ridiculous. <laughs> no one in the house. Two seconds later, I said, but you're no dummy. <laughs> no one, no one there. I stopped short of fist bumping the air. Cause that would just be crazy. I have long conversations with my cats. I ask them questions they couldn't possibly answer. They can't answer any questions, they're cats. It doesn't stop me from engaging them. I, literally, I, I've had moments with Monkey who's sitting in his place on the table and I've looked him in the eye and said, I don't know what to do. Should I break up with her? I don't know what to do. And Monkey just sits there like a cat. And I say, what does that even mean? And wait, La Fonda has been on my stomach. <laughs> Laugh out loud, don't laugh into the gloves. It's making a weird sound. <laughs> we're, we're, we're recording a CD. The laughter has to be somewhat level. And I think when you were laughing into your gloves, it made a very weird noise. I think freaked out a lot of people right up here. Right up here. <laughs> it literally sounded like woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Like I thought you were making an animal noise in response to the cat, which was not the appropriate animal noise. And I struggled in that moment, which distracted me from the joke to understand the meaning of the vague animal-like noise you were making, because I thought perhaps there was something to mine there. And then when I put my hand over the light, you were just laughing in your gloves. There's no time for shame, man. Fonda on my stomach, <laughs> making muffins, doing that cat thing. It's cute, right? It's cute, it's what, it's what you want cats to do. In that moment, I said, are you saying I'm fucking fat? And threw the cat off of me. And I, now, I worry about my cats, which is 
really more embarrassing than having cats as a man. <laughs> Actively worrying about your cat. Like, I, a monkey goes in and outside. He goes outside and inside. He's an indoor-outdoor cat. I, I love the cat, but, you know, I, and look, honestly, folks, I, I don't know if I've expressed this before clearly. I, I'm not a cat guy, okay? I'm a my cat guy. I don't give a fuck about your cats. If I go to your house, I'll pretend to out of politeness. I'll, I'll be like, oh, but secretly I'll be thinking, what a sad, fat, ugly, dumb cat you have. Lazy, it's not even moving. Oh my God, that cat is days away from hanging itself from its scratching post. Look at it, just a pathetic hostage to your pain and needs. Trapped in an apartment. My cat's an indoor-outdoor cat. It's a vital, wild animal. Your cat can't even muster up the gumption to play with what's left of that fake mouse you got it. It's pathetic. You should put that cat down out of you know, sympathy. Your cat is days away of dying from ennui. My cats are amazing. But I worry about them. You know, monkey goes inside and outside. He could get eaten by coyotes. He could. I have to live with that. Because I don't want to deny him that essential wild nature that he has in his heart. But I worry, I think, like, what if he gets eaten by coyotes? And then I rationalize. I say things to myself like, that's a pretty noble way to go out. <laughs> As an animal in a primal bloody struggle for survival with another beast. But I, I love monkey. <laughs> so that doesn't work. One time I was worrying about monkey and I actually said, Mark, there are, there are, there are parents that have children fighting in Afghanistan. And I thought, that would be horrible to have a cat in Afghanistan. <laughs> in a poorly armored carrying case with no kitty flak jacket and an unending war with an unclear agenda. That would, that would be horrible. I'd much rather he be eaten by coyotes like the god that doesn't exist intended. My parents are still alive, uh, which is, you know, some days great. <laughs> I've started to look at my parents as some sort of emotional terrorist organization. <laughs> and, and whether or not they know it, they, they, they've wired me to emotionally explode and detonate when anyone gets close to me. But for some reason, as they get older, and I don't know if this is a common experience, they, they divulge information that I don't want to or need to know about me and about them. I don't know if it's a burden they're carrying or, or they, they've got this, you know, this, this stuck in their soul and they need to get it out. But literally, it, 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 where they're at now, they say things where I have this response sometimes where I'm like, I would have rather have struggled in the darkness for the rest of my life then be given this information. There's a reason there are, there's no statute of limitations on that kind of shit. You're a parent, don't fucking tell me. The thing my mother said was that thing. The thing my father said was okay. I was, I was in uh, Arizona for my niece's bat mitzvah. I was, it was my job to, to uh, as it usually is, to buffer my father from every other human. <laughs> That's why I'm a comedian. <laughs> my father is a manic depressive. Uh, my first gigs were introed by my mother saying to me, Mark, could you just go upstairs and make him laugh? You're the only one that can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm on. So I go to Arizona and uh, I go to pick up my father. And I thought we were going to my brother's house to hang out with his kids. I go to his hotel room and I say, okay, you ready? We're going over to see the kids, right? And he goes, what for? <laughs> and I said, because they're your grandchildren. And he says, eh, some people get something out of that. I don't get anything out of that. <laughs> And I said, let me get my notebook. <laughs> and 
I said, then what are we going to do? He goes, well, I've been looking for mustard slacks for 16 years. <laughs> And he said something like, you remember mustard slacks? And I said, sure, Dad. <laughs> the other one was at Thanksgiving. Uh, my mother, who uh, has an aversion to food of all kinds. She's frightened of it. It, resents, it represents nothing nourishing or good to her. Just re resents the, re I said it twice, resents. <laughs> yes, I do resent her. <laughs> <laughs> my mother just is, uh, you know, she's got this eating problem. She's been 119 pounds my entire life. And because of that, I am also frightened of food. And, I, and I've tried to figure out why, but I, the only thing I could come up with is that she, she, the horror to her of having a child that might be overweight was so profound. Her fear was, you know, just displaced onto me. Like, I really think that for about the first 12 years of my life, my mother just saw me as her fat. That, that she, I think, some part of her thought that if, if she just ate less, perhaps I would disappear and she would not have to worry about the fat that was on me that was somehow connected directly to her. No, uh, 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 uh. This has to be funny. <laughs> there, <laughs> and if you're doing that to this, I mean, what she said to me is heavy, but I, I processed it. <laughs> Though I wish she hadn't said it, but I was grateful for it. And that's the thing is that you have to learn how to be grateful for these disclosures even no matter how fucked up they are. So I, I'm preparing something with butter in it, and she's, you know, asking me why. And, and she just says to me, you know, I, I think, I should, I, think I, I, I should tell you something. And, you know, I tolerate her, and, and we, were, we get along okay. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm ready. And she says, you know, when, when you... When you were a baby, I, I don't think I knew how to love you. And I said, I, I think I can remember that one. I don't have to write that one down. But the benefit of these poetic tidbits is that now I can go back to my therapist and just walk in and go, I think we're done. I think, I think I've got the missing pieces. This vague emotional void is now my mom and dad, and they're just all filled in right there. <laughs> I, uh, I do need to get out of my head, though. I, uh, yeah, I've always been called heady, and, and for some reason when people tell you that, when they say that you're heady, they think that they're, they're being nice, and it's really a, a horrendous insult. You know? <laughs> You're very heady. I get it. So, like, I don't live in the real world. I'm, you know, I'm just working through things in my mind and making stuff up. And, you know, I'm intelligent, but I can't activate it in a way that has any, you know, real impact on anything. And, and I'm just spinning plates up there. And you're just watching me spin plates saying, oh, look at the heady man. And they say, exactly, exactly. That was... A good illustration of being heady. <laughs> so I've now been told that I should get out of my head. So now I'm on a train, a subway here in New York, worrying about being in my head, just sitting there sweating. It's summer. I'm repelling down the pit of self, you know, <laughs> looking for something helpful. I might have scrawled on the wall on a, another trip down there, some artifacts, some stone tools, an old baby toy. And a woman walks onto the train with a box, and in the box is an ice cream maker. I know because it's on the box. And immediately, like that, I go, fuck, I love ice cream. I need an ice cream maker. I've got to get an ice cream maker. How do you even make ice cream? How do you make chocolate ice cream? Could I make ice cream as good as the ice cream you get in the store? Because that would be fucking amazing. I read on the label of haagen that there's eggs in it. Do you freeze eggs and the germs go away? Is it okay to put eggs in ice cream? Is eggs in all ice cream? How do you make vanilla ice cream? I fucking love ice cream. I don't think I could have an ice cream maker because that'd be like living with a drug dealer. I mean, how, how would I handle that? I, but I would love to make good chocolate ice cream. And then I just, I literally had to say, dude, get out of your head. 
And then I had to stop myself from yelling out loud at the woman, I guess you can handle it. <laughs> I want to yell at people in public. Because I'm a good person. I think I'm, I think I'm a good person. Feeding people in Darfur right now. Hold on, I gotta throw a couple of bags of rice off the truck. Okay, they're good here, let's move on. I almost killed two people. They were in the street. I was driving down my street, minding my own business, texting. And all of a sudden I look up and there are two people in like literally about to be killed by my car. The surprising thing about that moment is in that moment I was not terrified that I was going to hit them. I was angry that they were there because I was texting. I literally thought, what are you doing in the street? I'm holding my phone, <laughs> thinking that I am the valid one. <laughs> and then it was, it was at that moment that I realized that texting and driving is really more dangerous than drinking and driving, because at least when you're drunk driving, someone is driving the car. <laughs> When you're texting and driving, no one's driving the car. Nobody. When you look, do you even realize what you're risking your life to say? When you're sitting there going, fuck you, soy milk, is like, oh, what the fuck? And you're wondering how long your car has been an unanchored, hurling piece of metal and plastic with no one in charge of the wheel. Soy milk is what? <laughs> Worth dying for. Soy milk's supposed to be better for you. <laughs> and I, I can't stop doing it. I don't know if it's because I don't do drugs anymore, I don't drink anymore, there's very few things I can do that will get me the rush. There's something completely addicting about slamming on your brakes. It's an adrenaline high. You know, there are a lot of sports that people can do that they have some control over that would give them that, that there is a predictability to it. I'm gonna jump out of this plane, I'm gonna fall, it's gonna be thrilling. You know, I'm gonna rappel up this mountain or down the mountain or whatever, mountain, whatever it is, extreme sports, who cares? But none of those have the spontaneity of almost killing somebody, maybe yourself. <laughs> and you don't know when it's gonna happen. But that moment when you slam on your brakes and go, fuck, and you don't hit what you're about to hit is fucking divine. <laughs> it's, like, it's like being born. And if you're hung up on having last words, if you die in an accident texting and driving, you will have last words. They will be documented. They will be there frozen. <laughs> and I, I guarantee you they will be fragmented and stupid. <laughs> I picture I die in an accident texting. It's my funeral. A few comics show up. Not a lot. A few. <laughs> I get it. I know that day. You going to Marin Singh? What, the funeral? I don't know. I kind of knew him. I did his podcast once, good guy. <laughs> but I picture there are two comics talking, I'm not gonna name names, I don't know who I can count on. <laughs> and one of them says to the other, so did Marin have any last words or anything? And the other guy goes, dude, you didn't hear it, he died texting, he was driving and texting, he had, he, they, he had last words, they were there. 
And the other guy's like, well, what, what, what were they? And the other guy goes, I think they were, fuck that, L.O. <laughs> Which I would not be ashamed to have on my tombstone. I think it's a very fitting epitaph for me. <laughs> Rest in peace, Mark Marin. Quote, fuck that, L.O., dot, dot, dot. And then in parentheses, sometimes the laughter wasn't out loud. <laughs> Unquote. Hold on, in the middle of a Habitats for Humanity project. <laughs> no, no, it's your house. No, 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 we built it for you. Yes. For, yeah, it's free. Oh, just to see the looks on their faces. <laughs> so, I'm not a religious person. You know, I'm a Jew. I was raised to, to be selfish by Jewish parents. And I was recently in Cincinnati and I, I, I chose to go to the Creation Woo! Nest Museum. Yeah, some of you are familiar. Yeah, I, yeah it's like the Creation Nest Museum. And it was about 30 miles away in Kentucky and uh, I did a little research and it was, I needed to go, I needed to, to go. For the wrong reasons. <laughs> Obviously. But I needed to witness. I needed to, to go to this tabernacle of ignorance. <laughs> and I went there thinking, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be you know, horrified, you know, and, you know, angry, smug, condescending, righteous, you know, pompous even. And just judging these fucking idiots that are going there for what they see as the right reason. I knew I was going for the wrong reason. And I got there, and right away, I walked in, and I was like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> A lot of money went into making this. They're really selling. This is you know, it, just a, a tabernacle of, of Christian creationist propaganda. And, and, and people flock to it. And the only thing they're trying to establish in that museum, the only thing, it's not about Jesus. There's literally hardly any Jesus. The only thing they're trying to establish is that at one point in time, human beings and dinosaurs could hang out. That's the only thing. That's the entire agenda. That at some point in time, a person could go, come here, boy, come here, boy, to a fucking dinosaur and say, you want a carrot? Here's a carrot. Why, she eats carrots. They believe the world is about 6,000 years old. Now, human beings as we know them, or roughly, they probably really kind of came about about 250,000 years ago. Dinosaurs that they're talking about, probably about, what, 300 million years ago. All right, so the gap they're trying to close is a good 300 million year gap <laughs> that they're just trying to close up with pseudoscience and interesting dioramas. <laughs> Now, I know in my heart there are people going there that are actually on the fence. Like, I don't know about this. <laughs> and they walk out of that museum going, I, pretty clear to me. <laughs> that one diorama, I don't know how it could be more clear. <laughs> I actually didn't get really upset about the agenda of the museum. What upset me more than anything was this one room where it was sort of a display room, you know, about the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they had these audio animatronic uh, dolls that were lifelike, lifelike. And you walk into this room and on the left side of the room, you had Isaiah, the prophet. You had Moses with his commandments. You had Abraham who was pensive and sitting for some reason and had a harp-like instrument. I don't know why. <laughs> and they couldn't have looked more Jewy. <laughs> and it was offensive to me 
as a Jew that doesn't believe in any of this shit. But I was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it might as well have been Sid Caesar, Gabe Kaplan, and Richard Lewis sitting there. And then the black should have rent Jews from the past. Literally, it looks as though Moses should have had both tablets in one hand and a bagel and schmear in the other going, why not? And Isaiah should have been saying, enough with the food already, always with the food, enough. And Abraham should have just been sitting there going, please stop fighting again and again. It's offensive because I knew it was true because when you turn the corner and go to the New Testament side, they have the Apostle Paul who is sitting patiently, solemn, thoughtful, looked like Ben Gazzara. There was, there was nothing about him that revealed any Semitic DNA whatsoever. He had flat nose, Mediterranean skin, a square jaw. He was wearing a red sash and a white robe and he had important papers. And he was directly across from the history of the Borscht Belt. And the expression on his face to me just read, Jews. I found that offensive. But then you make your way to the Garden of Eden. This is the important room. Because by this point, you should be pretty well mind-fucked. And the horrible thing is that you see parents with children encouraging them to take this shit in and you think, where is child services when you know? <laughs> But the Garden of Eden was pretty spectacular. Garden of Eden was beautiful. You walk in, there's animal noises. It's big, it's a garden. It's beautiful. Animals, just Adam. It's, uh, it's the pre-Eve Eden, so it's idyllic. <laughs> No problems. I'm not sexist. It's in the Bible. Which is sexist. But you walk in and the first animal you see there in the back of the garden, Eden, it's a grizzly bear, it's a grizzly bear. Why not? God's weird with his choices. <laughs> it's a classic taxidermy grizzly bear up on its hind paunches. Is that what you say? On its haunches? With its hands like this, with the, uh, you know, like you see in, you know, weird old places when you travel across country. You know. <laughs> Curio shops. So there's a grizzly bear, there's an antelope. I don't know. <laughs> Over here, some deer. In the middle sits Adam, alone holding a white lamb, which is either to foreshadow Christ or he's fucking it. <laughs> either one possible in pre-Eve Eden. Here's what happens, man. Here's where they start to... So you move past Adam. And just to the left of Adam, a single white penguin. Doesn't matter, that's not the right climate. It's Eden, don't judge, as a penguin. And then I realized this was just a, a, a mental palate cleanser for what's about to happen. Because you said, okay, penguin, you turn the corner, T-Rex, <laughs> eating a pineapple. <laughs> and my only thought at that moment was like a pineapple. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, they got me.
And really, because I was so hooked into the narrative of the museum, I was like, I, I hope they explain why that carnivorous ancient reptile would be enjoying some vegetables, some fruit. They did. The next room you go into, everything is explained. Apparently, between the fall of man and the flood, those two events erased completely man's ability to reason <laughs> and science's ability to be effective in any way. <laughs> washed away. The great flood washed away science. <laughs> so in the room, the next room, there's some exhibits. It's just really a domestic uh, scene and there are little information cards explaining what life was like before the fall and what life was like after the fall. What did we lose as people after the fall? What changed? Weird selection of things. <laughs> <laughs> like the first one was, was disease. There was no disease before the fall. But after the fall, viruses and bacteria were like, it's our time. And then there's only like six of these things. The next one, odd things. The next one was venom. Venom. <laughs> Out of all the things, venom. There was no venomous animals. Snakes, all the things. Bad lizards. Harmless. <laughs> After the fall, holy shit. <laughs> Look what our things can do. <laughs> They're playing to the kids with this thing. No meat eating before the fall. That would explain the pineapple. No carnivorous things. That's, that's, a, that's an important detail. That is why people could be like, let's ride the dinosaur. No fear, as long as there's pineapple around. After the fall, fuck it, we're gonna eat these fuckers. Then there was one that made me understand the entire museum and who they were really gearing their momentum towards. The next information plaque just said, weeds. <laughs> Before the fall of man, there were no weeds. <laughs> who the fuck could that plaque be for? <laughs> A guy who looks at that and goes, no way. Every year my yard is full of fucking no weeds. Before, oh, that must have been beautiful. I knew they were fucking evil. The ark, they, they put you inside the ark. They show you how it's constructed, cubits, and, and they, they have men with animatronic things and people building you know, moving things. And Noah's there explaining it. And he, had, he sounded like Count Chocula. Like, he, <laughs> like I, I couldn't understand the accent, but I couldn't help but think that it, there was some anti Semitic theme running. That, like, you know, they're like, well, we gotta have Noah, but he is a Jew, so let's make him scary. The ark was built, you know, like. <laughs> And then they had these, these, these architectural models of the Ark. And this was the, 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 the moment where it was just great to me that, you know, these scale models, like, you know, the building ones, the architects make with little people and like little bushes and things, and they look great. And you're like, you have to lean in, like, look at that detail. So it's the Ark scale model, which I, apparently they're going to build down there. They're building a, a full scale Ark. I just heard this and it's true. Because they're, they, they, they're pushing it off as, a, as a, some sort of exhibit, but they're, they're planning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're on the ramp, on the ramp, going up to the ark. These are little, little animals. Look at this, oh, two giraffes, two zebras, two lions, two brontosauruses. <laughs> <laughs> but at that point, your mind doesn't stop there. You're just onto the pigs. Brontosaurus is on the ark. 
I'm good with that. And some of you are like, there are no brontosauruses. That was not the proper name. Like, I got an email about that. That they're not called that. And you know what? I didn't even fucking make note of what they're really called because when I was a kid, it was a brontosaurus. And I think we all know what I'm talking about. I'm not here to do research. If my heart is in it and you get the idea. I think that's what we're going for. I don't have to... No species and genus. Whatever. So I guess what I mean to say is that, you know, after the full experience, I, I didn't take a picture. They had a, a, a triceratops with a saddle on it to really, <laughs> that you could sit on and take pictures. But, but I left not angry at them. I'm not angry at the museum, not angry at the people who were there. I, I was sort of elated. I, I felt sort of gloriously embarrassed for our country. But I felt deeply proud to be an American for, for a very weird reason. I was proud to be an American because I realized that what I was standing in the parking lot of could only happen in America. These are our fucking morons. And they've done a beautiful thing down here. And I think also, like, there's a, that, that idea that, like, even the, the worst Christians, if you meet them one-on-one, -on -one, are, you know, are probably pretty decent people. They're just, you know, they're just people. And I believe that that's true if you talk to them one-on-one. -on -one, they're probably pretty decent people. My fear has always been when they all come to get me, it's going to be a different interaction. More along the lines of, like, what are you, let me go! Dude, we were just talking, it's fucking me, God damn it! let me go! And that's what scares me. And I've lost my ability to judge believers. I used to judge them a lot. But I don't believe in God, but I'm not an atheist. I just don't care. <laughs> I, I wasn't brought up with it. I don't care. And I've grown to understand that if you have to, you know, kind of you know, you know, gather together some weird dogmatic or mystical system that works for you spiritually or somehow, uh, good, I hope you make it through. <laughs> Just don't drag me into it or push it on me and we're okay, I understand. I can't judge believers. I know that belief is necessary to feel part of something bigger than you. And because I don't have any real quest for God in my heart, I'm, I'm a very good consumer. Um, <laughs> because I can't deny the whole exists. But also, I've just lost my, 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 my urgency to argue. And, and, I, and I find that, they, that Christians are not annoying people when you talk to them. They're annoying, but they're a predictable kind of annoying. And they are pretty decent people. There are more annoying people than Christians. I, arguably, atheists, you know, really angry atheists, much more annoying than talking to a Christian. <laughs> for, for, I could talk to a Christian for half an hour. I could talk to an atheist for five minutes before I'm like, shut the fuck up, I get it. I know what you want. You're right. Yes, you're right. Vegans are much more annoying than Christians. Because it's the same conversation. I get it. I'm immoral. I can't. I'm, I'm killing with my mouth. I get it. Atheist vegans, horrendous people. And the difference between an atheist, a vegan, or an atheist, vegan, and a Christian, if a Christian is a real Christian, at least they know they're flawed. <laughs> okay. So, I've been traveling a, a lot. I was in Ireland. I'm okay with the Irish now. <laughs> Coming back from Ireland, I had an experience that made me question everything I thought I was in terms of race. Don't think it was an uncommon experience. It was not something that people necessarily share, and I don't know that it's been this dramatic for anyone else. Uh, I, I'd been up for about 18 hours, and I was flying back to Los Angeles from Ireland, and we'd made it across the ocean. We were in Chicago for the last leg of the trip from O'Hare to LAX. And I had been awake a long time, and I was tweaky, frazzled, felt kind of post-trip-ish, as in hallucinogenic trip-ish. You know, where you're a little sweaty, and like, things are a little jangly, and you're like, am I sweating chemicals? You know. And 
I'm on the plane, I'm sitting in the last row facing the wall where the screen is, or just around that wall is the flight attendant area. This is where the flight attendants sit in their area, and I'm sitting on the aisle. And you know, I'm shaky, I'm drinking coffee, because I'm like, why sweet, just hold out that thing. <laughs> See, sweet, just get all the sweeping done in one shot, don't do it. <laughs> You're gonna be fucked up, your clock is all fucked up. No, 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 in my head. And I get up to go to the bathroom, and I'm walking to the bathroom, and, and the bathroom is vacant, but standing right here next to the bathroom is a man who looks at me weird, and in that moment I decided, oh my, he's a dubious shade of brown. <laughs> Why is this man just standing by the bathroom looking at me strangely? And in that moment, I decided in my vulnerable, sleepless state that he was clearly Palestinian or Egyptian. And he had a plan. There was a problem at, there was a problem at hand here. And I know about it. And he knows that I know. I've got to handle this properly. So he looks at me and I look at him and I sense that he knows that I'm on to him. And he starts to walk down the aisle and in some sort of weird, like I thought I was being discreet, I'm going to follow him on the plane. There's no real way to discreetly follow somebody on a plane. Your space is limited. So he starts walking down the aisle. I'm like, two, three, four, and I start walking. And I'm following him, and I get to the flight attendant area just in front of my seat in the middle of the plane. He keeps walking. I watch him walk through business, through first, into the cockpit flight attendant area, and I am panicked and freaking the fuck out. My eyes are bugging. I'm completely focused on what I think is about to happen, and I hear a flight attendant right here to my right go, is everything okay, sir? And I go, what? Nah, uh, he... Because I knew what was happening in my head, but I knew maybe that's not a great idea to share. So... <laughs> She says, is everything all right, sir? And all I could come up with in that moment was, I, well, there's, there, I, there's a, a situation in my head. <laughs> and she said, sir, please sit down. Please sit down. And I'm like, I... <sighs> okay. I'll sit down. Now this is the moment where I really wish that my imagination was fueled by something other than panic. It, it really is fueled by panic. I, I don't, it is not free. I've not freed my imagination to make bunnies. <laughs> I don't know how to do absurdist humor or, or understand how to sell it. I don't understand it. <laughs> I can't be light and ridiculous. My imagination doesn't do that. I'm not, a, I'm not that guy, but if I am fueled by panic, Man, it goes to fucking town. I'm sitting there, I have been told to sit down and I know what's happening in the cockpit. This dubious brown man who's either Palestinian or Egyptian has specially treated rubber gloves on that are soaked in an ancient toxin that he has immuned himself to by ingesting it over the past three months. He has already touched the neck of the co-pilot and the pilot with the toxic rubber gloves. They have gone into cardiac arrest. A pink whitish foam is oozing out of both of their mouths as they make ghastly noises. And he's about to push them aside, get into the cockpit seat and fly us into something. And at that moment, I look up and I hear, sir, and I'm surrounded by the the entire flight crew <laughs> and, and I go yeah yeah what, what's up and they're like well we're concerned are you, are you okay and I'm noticing that the rest of the passengers are looking at me and I'm like I'm not the problem here <laughs> but you can't say that because some part of you is holding on to hope that you would be wrong Though I was a little more fragile than I should have been, but I, I was holding on to that hope, so I, I said, yeah, I'm okay. Everything's okay, knowing full well that it was moments, we're moments away from plunging. And they all walk away together, and at that moment where I'm about to really lose it, the dubious brown man who's either Palestinian or Egyptian comes walking back down the aisle, and I swear to you, looks at me with a look of like, <laughs> yeah. I knew you were one of them. That's how I read it. So nothing happened. 
And I sat there ashamed, angry at myself that I'd surrendered to this profiling experiment out of fear, mad at myself. I was embarrassed. And I just sat there festering in embarrassment for the rest of the flight and we're about to land and the flight attendant seats were right in front of me and the woman who initially told me or asked me if everything was okay was strapping herself into her seat. And I'm just sitting there like, eh. <laughs> and we're starting to land, we're starting to approach and she leans it to me and she says, um, what happened up there? <laughs> and I felt like I was gonna cry. <laughs> and all I could say was, there was a situation in my head. <laughs> and she looked at me very maternally and she says, it happens to all of us. I can't, I can't let do that. I'd been in Scotland for a month and my friend Don was staying at my house and I got home from being a month away. And, you know, Don left and I went out on my deck, my old deck, which was falling apart and I hadn't been home for a month. I said hi to my cats. I stood out on my deck and looked over the cactus garden that my ex-wife planted that I maintain out of spite. <laughs> to get reacquainted with who I am. <laughs> and in the middle of the cactus garden was this bubbling goo coming out of the ground. And I'm a fairly new homeowner, so my first thought was, well, fuck, someone's gotta fix that. <laughs> then of course you realize, I have to fix it. I don't know what it is, and I'm, I'm kind of baffled by it. I'm wondering if it's geological, is it, what's happening? And I see my, my neighbor Adam's on his deck and I go, Adam, dude, what, what's up with, what is that? And Adam, without missing a beat, just goes, that's shit. <laughs> and my first thought is, I've got a shit well? <laughs> did, did I learn about that at the Creation Museum? Does the earth sometimes get angry and shit at us as a foreshadowing for the next fall? Is the earth shitting at me? And then, of course, I, I, I went into some other thing where I'm like, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, it's a sign, it's a symbol, it's, it's a whole... It, I mean, it, she planted the garden of thorny plants and beneath it is just shit. And, and that was what our relationship was built on. It was thorny and it's built on shit. And then I'm like, dude, you took one semester of film. <laughs> Snap out of it. It's not semiotic time. I say, Adam, what do we do about that? He goes, well, man, it looks like it's right on the sewer line. You just follow the pipe down and pop open the clean out, see what comes out, and then we find out where the clog is. And I'm like, oh, fuck, you lost me at, at, at all of it. Can you help me? Fucking neighbor says, absolutely. Wow, would you do that? So he comes over and we, we sort of huddle around this clean out which is basically just a valve on the pipe that you that's designed to do this so you can get into the pipe at different places and there's a top on it and he looks at me he's like we don't know how much shit's gonna come out of here <laughs> when we pop the top off and certainly i'm familiar with that on an emotional level <laughs> so he pulls it off and I'm ready to like, what? And it just kind of goes <laughs> It's a little disappointing. So I say to Adam, I say, are we good? Are we done? It's all fixed, just cap it back up. He's like, no, dude, you gotta get a rooter. I'm like, do you have a rooter? He's like, no, I don't have a rooter, you gotta call a rooter guy. What, a rooter guy? So I go Google rooter. I find a rooter guy in my neighborhood, Earl's rooter. <laughs> I call Earl, it's like Sunday, it's Memorial Day weekend, it's a bad weekend to be playing around with shit wells. <laughs> I call the number and the guy just goes, yeah. And I'm like, is this a business? <laughs> Not sure what I, I wanna say what I gotta say if this isn't who I think I need to be talking to. <laughs> just launch into a 
shit problem in your yard with a stranger. And I go, is this Earl Ruder? He's like, yeah, this is Earl, what's up? I'm like, I got, I popped open the clean out, a little bit of shit came out of it, I need a Ruder out here, and uh, he's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm right here, I'm in Highland Park. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. I can't get my guy today, is there anywhere there to help? And I'm like, well, Adam's here, but I might have depleted his neighborly. <laughs> He's done enough, but I can help you, Earl. He's like, all right, I'll be over, it'll be $150. I'm like, okay, good. He comes over with the Ruder machine, which is a large 100-foot steel coil with blades on it hooked to a motor, and we had to lift this thing and move it into the garden. And I'm getting, I'm taking hits, I'm hitting cactuses, I'm getting a little bloody. Cats are on the deck wondering what's up. A little surprised. Is he becoming a dog guy? <laughs> I reassure him, we're good, we're good. I'm good. What does that even mean? <laughs> and then now Earl, now I got the play by play. Earl turns the engine on, we're running the rooter into the hole. And Earl's like, we gotta let her get down there about 20 feet or however 30 feet to where the clog is. I'm like, sounds good, man, let's do it. And he's running her in, and he's like, she's down there about 20 feet. I'm like, what's gonna happen? He's like, well, the water's gonna whoosh out here when we hit the clog. She's probably down there about 35 feet. And then all of a sudden the water goes whoosh. And it just opens the pipe. And Earl goes, yep, she got her. What we gotta do now, I'm just gonna let her run all the way down to the end of the pipe, make sure it's all clean. I'm like, okay, let her do that. And she, and he's like, ran, 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 ran. And then like a few minutes go by and he's like, oh shit. And he starts pulling at it like, oh no, we're in trouble. And I'm like, oh fuck Earl, what's going on? And Earl says, she's down there too deep. The gravity in the water might suck her in. And I'm like, I know how that feels, Earl. Let's get her out of there. So he starts going, oh, fuck me, oh, come on, girl, come on, baby. And he gets hold of it and he pulls her up. And he's rolling it up. And he says, oh, that was close, I almost lost her. And I'm depleted from my codependent position in this relationship with Earl. And I took a minute and I thought to myself, what is the cutoff for referring to machinery as her? I mean, if there's ever a situation where you should just man up and own that dick, it's this situation. There's no feminine attributes at all to a rooter. I felt like saying, Earl, get hold of yourself. You just fucked the shit out of that shit pipe with your 100-foot shit cock. You'd be proud of that, man. Be proud. about the important stuff. Matters of the heart. I, I, think, I think I'm over my divorce and um, it's been a long time. What is that? You don't feel like I'm over my divorce? Honestly, I thought I was. I really thought I'd done everything I could to process it and it faded and everything was okay after being consumed with, with revenge fantasies and spite and anger for years. I, thought, I really thought they had dissipated. Until not too long ago, I heard that my ex-wife had a baby. And my first thought after hearing that was, no, oh, that's your move? <laughs> that's how you're gonna play it? I get it. Spite baby, okay. Had a baby at me. You think you win? I don't think so. I think I'm a good person, but I can't tell you how many hours I spent hoping that baby was born without a face. Now, I really just wanted her to spend nine months to push out this faceless freak, this blank head with a wet, wisping hole in the middle of it going <laughs> that she had to 
feed for the rest of that infant's life, rationalizing like parents do, saying things like, he's really smart. <laughs> and we think he can feel colors. <laughs> The kid's okay. And I think I'm a good person. What am I gonna do for that one? I gotta, gotta help Dennis onto the toilet. All right, Dennis, we'll do this, but don't yell at me again, okay? It's uncomfortable for me too. So, Let's move into the romance. I've been dating aggressively for the last few years. We're sexually acting out, it's unclear to me. Is there a difference? Is there really a difference? Look, I don't have any kids. I know people have different agendas when they're dating. I, you know, I feel like I've been honest with women. I have dated, I, I have said things like, look, I'm, I'm bitter, I'm brokenhearted, I'm cynical. I'm hurt, I'm incapable of trust or intimacy. I don't know if I ever will be again. I would just like to fuck for a while. Are you good with that? It's amazing how many women hear that as, I love you. Please move in with me. He's a fixer upper. Because here's my experience. What happens is I meet somebody who has sex as quickly as possible, as often as possible, until you, you get about a, a week into it and you hit that first wall where you're like, I don't even know you. And she's like, I don't know you either. And then you have to trauma bond for an hour or so. You know, like, well, my dad's manic depressive and <laughs> my mom has an eating disorder. And she's like, oh my God, I have an eating disorder. I'm like, of course you do. Can we just keep fucking? And then you, you fuck for a couple more weeks until you have to overcome the first minor obstacle together. And it's usually something ridiculous. Like, how can you not like tortilla chips? Everyone fucking likes tortilla chips. That's ridiculous. I mean, were you abused by a Mexican? Because that should have come out during the trauma bonding. I don't think you're being forthright with me. But I'm okay with it. Let's just keep fucking. And then, yeah, after about a month of that, I'm usually like, happy anniversary. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, today it seems like a year. So... It's been an exciting few years. I dated a stripper for a while, and I'm not a stripper guy. Uh, I don't, it, it was a, a weird thing. I, I, I don't have anything against strippers or strip clubs, or I just don't, I don't go, you know, primarily because I, I generally believe them. And so I, I met her in a different context. I met her at a party, and uh, she said she was a writer. And I said, well, what do you write about? She said, well, I write about stripping, sex work, and being a dominatrix. And I said, why do you write about that? She said, well, that's what I do. And I just held on to writer. <laughs> dating a writer who was an active sex worker and stripper and dominatrix. And don't get jealous. I mean, she was an age-appropriate stripper, which, you know, is a little sad. Um, but I don't really know how I became that guy. Yeah, I mean, you know what a dominatrix's job is. A dominatrix's job is basically to spank, hit, pee on, or stick things into sad men. This is what she... <laughs> This is what she did for a living. And, and I was a pretty jealous guy when I was younger, and, and I still am if I'm engaged. You know, I was the kind of guy, if a woman I was dating would leave for two hours, and they, she'd come back, and I'd be like, you know, where the fuck were you? Were you fucking around with somebody? What the fuck were you doing? You were fucking around with somebody. And I don't know how I became the guy that, given the same situation, just says, how was work? And it's the same question. <laughs> I didn't know if I was evolving or dead inside. <laughs> and I'm not a fetishistic person. I, I like just normal, soul meshing slightly disturbing, but you know, deeply moving sex that could lead to complete loss of identity and crying. I, I don't, I, you know, I'm normal, just straight up. I like the kind of, you ever had the kind of sex where that it's so good that in the middle of it, you're thinking, one of us is gonna die. <laughs> you know, that kind of sex. I don't need props and toys. I, I, for me, you know, there's just a very fine line between a dominatrix and a clown. I, I don't, it really depends on the arena. Very but we got, we were getting too attached and I knew it was only a matter of time before, like I said, all right, just give me the treatment, do the thing you do with the clients, let's, let's do it, I'm ready to try it. I don't want anything in me, but you can tie me up. 
and I know what would happen. I'd be tied up, and I'd be like, I'm not good with this. I'm not comfortable. This isn't fun. I, I, I knew I wouldn't get off on this. Please untie me. And she'd just be sitting there, smiling, looking at me, holding a ball gag, saying, the safe word is, marry me. <laughs> So now I've just been this guy that 20 to 35 year old women try to work out their daddy issues on. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I'm okay, I seem to be okay with it. But I know how it's gonna go. If I were to create a visual metaphor for my sex wife over the last few years, it would be me sitting at home alone, talking to myself angrily eating ice cream. Out in the street, I hear a 23 to 35 year old woman walking up the street, perhaps in the middle of the street, going, Daddy! Daddy! And I get up and I walk to the door and I open the door and I see this woman going, Daddy! I put my ice cream down, I open the door and say, I can do that. Come on in. Let me take up some of that daddy slack. And I know what happens. You don't take up daddy swag. You end up hanging from that rope, a burning effigy of her father, as she dances around saying, daddy's dead, daddy's dead, daddy's dead, and then moves on to a healthy relationship, rebuilds her relationship with her father, and I write new jokes. <laughs> So I'm involved with this woman. This is how I met her. It's a sweet story. And then we'll all go feeling uplifted. <laughs> I get an email on my website, which anyone can email me through. Hmm. <laughs> the other <laughs> subject line, hey, Mark Marin. Hmm. Hey, what? I open the email. I met you the other night in San Francisco. I don't know if you remember me. I didn't really. But I think you're hot. I think you're sexy. I want to fuck you. I'm not going to have this 27-year-old body forever. What do you say we have a fuck fest? So, of course, I think, this sounds healthy. <laughs> so I write back, okay, let's have a fuck fest. Where does the fuck fest take place? And she writes back, well, I see you're going to be in Portland. I live in San Francisco. I'll meet you in Portland for the Portland Comedy Festival. You fly up from L.A. We'll hang out in the hotel. We'll have a fuck fest. I'm like, great. So I show up in Portland. I meet her. She's cute. She's adorable. We have this fuck fest. I learned, you know, honestly, I'm a little too old for fuck fest. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, it was a one event a day festival. And... But, you know, the production values were good, and they were, you know, good performances, good shows. A lot went into them. Crowd was happy. So, of course, after Fuckfest 2010, being the cynical, broken-hearted douchebag that I am, I said, thanks, that was great, good meeting you, worked out, huh? Good times. Good luck with everything. Maybe I'll run into you again. Okay. I go back to L.A., she goes back to San Francisco. A week later, I get a text on my phone. Hey, remember me from Fuckfest? I'm moving to L.A., it's got nothing to do with you. I'm not a stalker. Okay, if there were a multiple choice question on a test that was things a stalker would say, thinking all of the above. So I text back, don't fucking move here, you're creeping me out, stalker. She texts back, fuck you, it's not all about you, I can live wherever I want. I text back, no, fuck you, you're gonna fuck my life up, I can feel it. She texts back, no, fuck you, you're not the boss of me, classic. So then I call her and I go, what the fuck are you doing, don't do this, man, it's not right, you're gonna fuck my life up. Then she starts crying, then I realize, oh shit, we're courting. When I realize that, I hang up on her. <laughs> then she proceeds to text me about 49 times in 30 minutes. Yeah, if you were to ask me, hey Mark, what does crazy mean? I could go, hold on, let me show you my phone. <laughs> if I were to take all those texts and run them one after the other as a free form poem and then deconstruct it critically, maybe along the lines of Northrop Fry's Anatomy of Criticism, if I understood that. I believe that the themes would be, fuck you, uh, why don't you wanna fuck me? 
when are we gonna fuck again, you selfish asshole? All classic literary themes. And then something happens. The 50th text had in it a photograph of her pussy. And that changed everything. I thought, I gotta rethink this. That's thoughtful. Because that took time. That wasn't the first shot. That took time. She had to hold her phone up over here and go, no. I'll move it down here. And then maybe move it under and up into here. Yeah. Send. Now, the weird thing about this story is two texts after the text of the vagina. I get a text from the guy who's building me a bookshelf of the finished bookshelf. And I don't know if it's age or what, but I was more excited about the bookshelf. I was like, oh my God, that's beautiful craftsmanship. Look at the grain on that wood. But I think on a deeper level, I thought I don't have to be afraid to put things in that. All my half-read books are not a threat to my mental well-being because I know I won't finish them. So, needless to say, she's, she's pretty, pretty much living with me. And if she was a stalker, she succeeded. And we fight. Because I fight. I don't know why I fight. But I fight with women. No hitting, just hitting with my mouth. I've been wrestling with this anger problem, and, and this woman, of course, you know, just brings it out of me, and we fight. So here's what happens. Here's the romantic story. <laughs> We're having a fight. I don't know about what. I don't know how long it's been going on for. None of those details matter, even when you're in a fight. <laughs> Windows are open. Front door's open. Screen is closed. Let's enter the fight with her lines. <laughs> Would you just stop fucking talking? Stop fucking talking. La, 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 la. Stop fucking talking. Me at the door. Get the fuck out of my house. Just get the fuck out of my house. Stop fucking talking. Get the fuck out of my house. I don't have to get out of your house. I found that confusing. <laughs> Threw me a little bit. And as I'm at the door telling her to please get the fuck out of my house, I see a Latino man approaching my porch, approaching my front door with his hands up like this looking upset. He's interrupting the arc of my fight. And I say to her, okay, baby, there's something, hold on a minute. And I stick my head out the door and I say, what's, what's up, man? We all right? What's up? He's like, please, please stop fighting. <laughs> I'm like, are, we, are you cool, man? He's like, no, please stop fighting. And I realized why he hand, had his hands up. It was, he was basically saying, civilian. <laughs> yeah. Not involved in the conflict. I go, what's, what's okay? Are you okay, buddy? He's like, just please stop fighting. They're going to call the police up the street. And I'm like, all right, okay, thank you. He's like, please. And then he starts crying. <laughs> and I'm like, what's up, man? He goes, I just lost my wife. <laughs> but in that moment, my, my first thought was like, she's not my fucking wife. <laughs> But I didn't say that. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's like, okay, okay, just please, please be kind. I'm like, I get it. You're, you're some sort of weird angel. <laughs> and then he says, do you love her? And I'm like, this is an awkward way for her to hear it the first time. <laughs> Hey, yeah, baby, I, I love you. The guy made me. Yeah. <laughs> Just be kind. I'm like, okay, man. All right. And he walks off the porch. And this is like shocking and heavy. 
and it just interrupted the whole sort of, you know, fight, cry, fuck, arc. I walk into the house, and she's sitting at the table with that look like, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I sit down, and I don't know really what to say, and she looks at me, and she says, I wish they'd call the fucking police. I'm like, why? And she says, see, so just stop fucking talking. And I'm like, okay. And then we sat there for about a minute, just not saying anything. And I'm trying to pull together my feelings and say something. And the only thing I could muster up in that moment was, you know, if we're going to do this, we really should close the windows. <laughs> and she said, definitely. <laughs> And then we had sex on a pile of clothes that had been taken out to pack. <laughs> Which is really the best sex you can have because everything depends on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're a great crowd. I'm happy that you like me. I hope that you still like me. Good night.